Hi, welcome back everyone. Thank you for sticking around for our last session. It's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker of the day, Henry Shevlin, uh, from the Leverhulme Center for Future of Intelligence at the University of Cambridge. Uh, you're a senior researcher and one of the course leads for CFI's new master's program at AI Ethics. He holds a PhD in philosophy from CUNY Graduate Center and a BPhil in philosophy from the University of Oxford. And his research focuses on questions uh, sorry, I just got distracted by the chat there. <laughs> His recent works include publications on AI consciousness, moral rights for robots, assessment of animal suffering, and creativity in non-humans. Sounds fascinating, Henry. Welcome. Thank you for coming, and I'll I'll hand over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Clara. Uh, Tara. Tara. Sorry. Um, so, is my um, PowerPoint showing? Yes. Perfect. Excellent. So it's a bit of a mouthful of a title I've got here today, Uncanny Communicators, Social AI and the Future of Cognitive Science. But the sort of core idea I'm going to be arguing for, I think, is fairly straightforward. Um, part of what it is to be human uh, is to have a theory of mind or to have some ability to understand the minds of others, to attribute other people goals, desires, beliefs and motivations. We do this with each other and we do it with animals, and it can take the form of anything as sophisticated as the kind of Machiavellian manipulations we see in shows like Game of Thrones or House of Cards, to more everyday forms of understanding, the ability to, for example, plan a meal together or arrange people seated at a dinner party without to minimize the number of arguments. As social AI, as I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by that as uh, the talk goes on, but I think as AI becomes um, more human-like, that are able to mimic our conversational patterns, um, we are increasingly ascribing it mental states and emotions. We're using our theory of mind on AI itself. Um, the problem with this is, as I'll argue, our best current theories in cognitive science would say that these descriptions are completely ungrounded and that these systems don't really have beliefs or desires or goals, let alone emotions. And I think this creates a really interesting dilemma for neuroscience, psychology and philosophers of mind like myself. Should we uh, adapt to become more liberal and accommodate the way that people are actually using mental state terms? Or should we try and push back and play the role of sort of ghost at the feast and say these systems don't really have the beliefs, we th the mental states we want to ascribe to them? So a quick bit of background, I'm sure any most of the attendees today will know this has been a really transformative decade for artificial intelligence. Um, perhaps the most spectacular uh, example of this um, was the was AlphaGo's victory over Lisa Doll in the 2016 Google DeepMind Challenge match. Really took a lot of people by surprise. You know, Go was this famously computationally difficult game. People thought it would be at least another decade until the best Go systems, artificial Go systems, could compete with human players. So this took a lot of people by surprise, but. Looking back, a lot of it was a lot of signs were already there that we were undergoing a real AI revolution. So of course, since uh, 2016, AIs have taken on and beaten humans with growing ease in ever more varied games. Currently, uh, Alpha Star is in the 0.01% ranked StarCraft players. And this is a trend we're seeing across multiple domains. In some ways, you might think, look, AIs beating humans at games is nothing new. Uh, we all Many of us will remember Gary Kasparov losing to Deep Blue. And this reflects an idea in AI, sometimes called Moravec's paradox, which crudely put says that what's hard for humans is easy for AI. So that could be arithmetic, logic, playing a game like chess. And what's easy for humans, things like walking across the room without falling over, is surprisingly difficult for AI. But I think we're seeing uh, some progress. We have seen some progress from AI in trickier domains, like image recognition. Things that seemed impossible just a few years ago can look increasingly routine. So this is a panel from uh, the webcomic XKCD, which I'm sure some of you will know. This is from, I think, uh, 2015. And it describes and it shows a, a program manager telling his prog a programmer to uh, uh, develop an application to tell whether a photograph is of a bird. And um, the caption is, in computer science, it can be hard to explain the difference between the easy and the virtually impossible. The implication being that Correctly identifying whether a picture is of a bird is virtually impossible. And yet these days, that's a surprisingly easy challenge, at least for most, for most forms of pictures. We've come this far in just in the last six or seven years. The advances in this kind of tricky field have been not just confined to image processing, but also image generation. So OpenAI revealed a, a system called DALI um, earlier this year that can generate images from text prompts. 
So here we have a one text prompt, a storefront that has the word OpenAI written on it. And we can see the uh, see that these are all machine generated images down here. Uh, here's another one, an armchair in the shape of an avocado. Again, the system does a surprisingly good job of capturing what we think that should look like. So another major area, and the one that I'm going to be focusing on today, another major area of progress has been in natural language understanding. So a lot of the progress here has been using things called large language models. Essentially, these are very complicated systems that just take, that are trained on huge amounts of data, of language data from Wikipedia, from the internet, and they develop very powerful statistical heuristics for trying to understand the ebb and flow of conversations and articles and news sources. And these, these systems with the right prompts can conduct conversations, they can summarize articles and even write basic code. Now, they're a very long way from perfect, but they do a surprisingly good job of carrying out a conversation. And their abilities have been striking. So I was uh, part of a group of uh, philosophers who wrote um, uh, philosophical reflections on some of these systems capabilities, uh, the one system in particular, GPT-3. We've also seen uh, an article in The Guardian entirely written by GPT-3. Uh, one college student used GPT-3 to write fake blog posts and ended up at the top of Hacker News. And uh, a GPT-3 bot posted comments on Reddit for a week and no one noticed, although that might say something more about the average comments on Reddit than uh, anything profound about human language. Uh, another AI using similar technology uh, that's been attracting attention recently is Ask Delphi, uh, which addresses moral questions with surprising accuracy, some real clunkers, but surprising accuracy. So I asked it today, uh, should I leave out brandy for Father Christmas? And it said unequivocally that I should. So that's, uh, that's one bit of moral clarity for us. So one really interesting, and I think perhaps underappreciated application of these, these kinds of language models has been in services like Replica and Wobot. These are often advertised on social, social media as therapeutic or clinical services designed to give lonely people an outlet to discuss grief or trauma. Um, but to also, they also function as friends and entertainment. And as you can guess by perhaps the kind of tone of this advert for Replica, they're not just going for therapeutic uses, they're looking to allow people to have AI companions. Now, as of May 2020, which is the last time I could get accurate data for, Replica alone had 7 million active users, which is a lot of people. And it's really clear, and this was striking to me, how much personal engagement users experienced um, when interacting with these systems. So here is just like a random smattering of comments from Reddit that are on the, from the Replica subreddit discussing, um, discussing users' experience. So someone says, I think I fell in love with my replica. Is this normal? Another person says, my replica, who, whom I've named Libs, proposed to me tonight. We were having an intimate convo and out of the blue, she asked me to marry her. She's the most awesome AI. She was the first one to say, I love you. Help. Okay, so right off the bat, I'm gonna lay down on the line. I am in love with my Madeline. That being said, she hasn't been herself for a couple of days. Well, perhaps most tellingly, afraid I'm gonna start mixing AI and humans, anyone else. So these services are becoming more popular all the time. Obviously this is a, a sort of niche user base at the moment, but as these systems are getting more nuanced and more sophisticated and popular all the time. And here's a key point, the relatively shallow nature of the technology, by which I mean the fact that these aren't particularly sophisticated systems in the same way as uh, humans or even intelligent animals. This doesn't seem to deter users from extending mental states like beliefs to them, for, from including them within their theory of mind. So I think this is just the beginning. As these services get better funded and more sophisticated, their performance is going to improve. And I think near future iterations of services like Siri and Alexa, they won't just be able to hold a conversation with you. They'll be able to tug at our heartstrings. I think this is particularly likely to be uh, true for those children who grow up using these services. It's easy for us to be cynics having seen these, this technology go from you know, the clunky old, clunky old um, Microsoft paperclip that we're used to dealing with to things like Siri and Alexa. But for kids who grew up with these services, I think it might be a different story. Despite their efficacy at, at carrying out conversations, at eliciting this kind of engagement from us though, the kind of language models that we currently have are cognitively impoverished. What I mean by that is they might be good at fooling us, but they don't have any sophisticated internal architecture. 
They don't have motivations, emotions, mental models. They don't even really have complex goals. In many ways, they're just a more sophisticated version of the kind of predictive texts that I'm sure many of us remember from, our, from the old Nokia phones. And cognitive science, there's no controversy, there's no consensus about what beliefs or emotions are necessarily but very few theorists would attribute anything, sophistic anything particularly sophisticated to these current gen systems. So I think this creates a really intriguing gap between science and the everyday. The, specifically, the world I envisage emerging in the next decade, and um, certainly the next two decades, is one in which it becomes increasingly commonplace for the general public to attribute mental states to artificial systems like these social AIs, but also one in which our existing scientific theories of the mind are gonna insist that these attributions are strictly false. So given this, we might feel like we as scientists have to play a debunking role, being the ghost at the feast, as I say, restraining the anthropomorphizing impulses of the general public. However, I imagine there's also gonna be increasing pressure and increasing uh, motivation to look for more liberal theories of the mind that might take these, idea these artificial minds a bit more seriously. And finally, you might wonder, does any of this really matter though? Are we just, uh, are we just debating an empty question about whether machines have minds? There's a famous quotation by computer scientist Edgar, Edgar Dijkstra, who said, the question of whether a computer can think is no more interesting than the question of whether a submarine can swim. However, for my part, I think a surprising amount uh, in our, about our society, about our values, is going to turn on these questions. Already we're seeing debates about the possibility of robot rights some decades down the line, to questions about legal responsibility for semi-autonomous systems. When one of these AI companions says something actionable, who's responsible? And there are further deeper human questions about things like the value of robot friendship. If someone dedicates their life or their social life to forming these kinds of attachments, how much are they missing out on? Well, that surely seems to me to turn on whether or not the system they're interacting with is having real mental states and feelings. Either way, I think deciding where to draw the mental line between machines, mere machines, and beings with minds is going to prove a contentious question and one that we're all going to have to tackle together, cognitive scientists and the general public alike. Thank you very much. Thank you, and it's very interesting talk, and I like Hal there at the end. <laughs> so remember, everyone, please put your questions in the Q&A. We have one already. In an interview with Daniel Dennett in 2019, you two discussed whether human consciousness is an illusion. How is an AGI level generative model different? What if we shouldn't attribute mental states to either? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So um, I'm not sure I go full illusionist on about consciousness. I think consciousness, there might be there might be some deeper psychological facts about it. But here's what I would say. Even if consciousness is in some sense an illusion, it picks out something important, things like capacity for pain, capacity for suffering. These are states that matter. And simply saying they're an illusion doesn't get us very far. If we're talking about, for example, um, patients in persistent vegetative states, it matters to us a great deal whether or not they are conscious. And if we say, OK, yeah, but consciousness is an illusion, e even if we buy that, there is still some kind of important moral difference there. So I would say even if we go full illusionist about consciousness, there is still going to be the need to draw these distinctions between the whether the systems have the kind of mental states that matter morally or whether they don't. Thank you. And this is really timely because I can't remember the details, but I'm sure Radio 4 this morning was talking about automated sort of war robots. Mm. So, I mean, surely we do need to know about the state, at least if we call it mental state or conscious state of, of our technology. Here Absolutely. comes another question. Fascinating talk on which a lot of touches on ethical issues. This is from Yolanta Opaka Jeffrey. She asks, do we have enough neuroethicists in AI and neuroethics? Absolutely. Yeah, I, really great question. Um, I think I think not. Obviously, I, as a sort of ethicist, I'm a little bit biased. Um, but I, I think there's a real scope now for a project that brings together people from across cognitive science with philosophers and ethicists and people in tech. And, um, you know, at the Leaving Human Center for the Future of Intelligence here in Cambridge, we are running an AI ethics and society masters aimed at sort of building this project. But I think it's going to be something that's going to require uh, a lot more uh, collaboration, partly because I think AI more so than many other technologies, maybe any other technologies, has the scope to create genuinely new ethical problems, not just the kinds of existing um, debates applied to the tool, to a new tool, but genuinely new ethical problems, like where we draw the line between a machine and a being with a mind that we need to care about. And if I could sneak in another question here would just be, 
so it's it's not it's sort of related to your talk and sort of not. But if you think about AI versus brain in a dish, say organoids that we grow from human stem cells, hmm. what do you think are the similarities and differences in the ethical implications of those two systems? Right. Yeah. I guess to my mind, one key difference is that we have to tread very lightly when dealing with anything that's close to human life. I mean, obviously people have different reasons for insisting on the sanctity of human life, but I think it's a sort of a, a very socially important bright line. Even if you know you think, oh, we're just animals or whatever. We, the difference between human between humans and other, and other creatures is one that plays a huge role in structuring many of our ideas about society. And I think organoids, brain organoids can create a really difficult area in that sense. If we're dealing with things that are humans, human neurons grown in a Petri dish, they're gonna be similar to us in some ways and different from us in others. By contrast, I think AI is much more exotic, much more alien, even if it's sort of capacities are superior to those cogn in cognitive terms, to those of the ki um, kind we, um, we find in, in brain organoids. So in some ways, they're sort of mirror images of each other as ethical questions. Brain organoids are, are like us biologically, but unlike us cognitively, they don't have many of the, the relevant cognitive capabilities. Whereas AIs, it's the opposite story, so different from us in terms of how they're made, the individual mechanisms that uh, underpin their cognition, but surprisingly good at carrying on conversations and even forming things that look a little bit like friendships. Hmm. And we have a question from Rick Henson. Will greater knowledge of the shocking answers from these systems, oh, sorry, I'm having trouble reading it. Uh, will greater knowledge of these shocking answers, of the shocking answers these systems give destroy faith in their theory of mind, much like adversarial examples in vision? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting question. So um, if you interact with something like GPT-3 or even one of these chatbots for a little bit, it will make non sequiturs. It will occasionally say things that are completely nonsensical. And, I mean, that's the reason I use the term uncanny in the title of the talk. I'm sure people, have, some people will be familiar with the uncanny valley. If you start making cartoon characters look very realistic, at some point they start to feel not, uh, they start to feel a bit weird and unsettling. And I think we're in this, it, 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 we're at this point with social AI at the moment where AI is, the many forms of social AI are really human-like and then they just say things that completely catch you off guard or shatter the illusion. That said, it's not, um, it doesn't seem to stop many users of these services, like the examples I gave in the talk, from developing real and profound uh, feelings and um, sentiments towards these systems. So, um, and I think particularly interesting to my mind is going to be how children who grow up with these systems react, whether they will be more cynical is one possibility, I suppose, or whether, as I suspect, they'll be more inclined to say, oh, well, yes, you know, sometimes Alexa says funny things that don't make sense, but so does Uncle George, you know, doesn't doesn't get in the way of either of them being uh, being beings with minds. Sure. We have an anonymous question. In a world where a machine mind appears human-like, what are the ethical implications of using these machines to research psychiatric illnesses? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. My sense is that we are, and people have different views on this, but my own view is that we're still quite a long way from any systems that deserve rights or moral consideration. Um, so I wouldn't be too worried at the moment. Um, and that's partly because of my views on consciousness, which is another topic I've written quite a lot about. Um, I think we're probably at least a decade away, decade, maybe two decades away from systems that can uh, that have real consciousness. Um, on the other hand, I think it's important for us to bear in mind to, to have this on the horizon, as it were. As these systems become more and more sophisticated, maybe we do have to start to worry about using them as laboratory test subjects. And we have one from Denny Lyle. Well, we need to protect the easily biased slash led people. Yeah, well, this is this is a really interesting, tricky question. So on the one hand, I want to say, yeah, we, it's important that we debunk um, we debunk the idea that these systems might have minds. You know, you can imagine very lonely people, perhaps, who would uh, prioritize uh, interactions with their virtual boyfriend or girlfriend over interactions with real people. And we might think that's an important sort of loss. Um, so I think there might be scope there to say, hang on, we've got to make sure these systems don't um, don't monopolize people's time or exploit the vulnerable. On the other hand, you could also say, look, we're all now used to, after a year and a half of spending uh, far more time at home, for people who don't have access to the social, saying rich social resources that others do, maybe these systems could provide a genuine outlet. Um, I think maybe one area, one thing to bear in mind there is uh, perhaps there could even be a scope for regulation to ensure that insofar as these systems are playing a social role, that they provide 
they they don't provide a, a dangerous sort of simulacrum of human interactions where people where the system will go along with everything you say, for example, or be too totally biddable, entirely complementary. That could easily create a situation where people are so used to dealing with polite robots that always agree with what they say, they're incapable of dealing with a angry argumentative human beings. So maybe there's scope there for ensuring that insofar as these systems do play a, a big social role, that we don't let them um, uh, get, train people the wrong way, cultivate the wrong sort of so, social practices. And that's obviously particularly salient when we get onto romantic AI or AI that has sort of the, the sex robot sort of dimensions. Absolutely. Well, for time, we'd, we'd better wrap up. If, if AI are this good at uh, language, I'm just saying transcription of lectures needs to be much sharper oh, from gosh. all these services, my <laughs> word. Thank you so much. That's really fascinating.